Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this MPTL course entitled 20th Century Fiction. We were looking at Virginia Woolf's novel, uh, Mrs. Dalloway. So we'll just carry on from the point that we left last time. So we talked about how uh, Razius uh, alienation, the wife of Septimus Razius alienation is sort of doubly uh, present, doubly experienced because first of all, she's Italian uh, and so she finds herself completely alienated and cut off from London. And secondly, obviously, linguistically, culturally, she finds completely alienated. And she's also with a medically um, ill husband uh, who is essentially alienated as well because of his trauma, uh, which is suffering and experiencing all the time, which makes, him, uh, which makes it impossible for him to connect to the rhythms of civilian life. And that disconnect also spills over into her. Uh, so that makes her doubly alienated. So, and uh, the, the loneliness of Razia is something which is not quite talked about as often as it should be in this particular novel, but something that we should pay special attention to. Uh, in what way is she alienated? In what ways uh, uh, is she alienated? And how is the alienation actually more complex than that of Septimus or uh, Mrs. Jalloway? <clears throat> so we just carry on from this point. There was nobody, this should be on the screen, there was nobody, her words faded. So a rocket fades. It sparks, having grazed away into the night, surrendered to it. Dark descends, pours over the outlines of houses and towers. Bleak hillsides soften and fall, it, fall in. But though they are gone, the night is full of them, robbed of color, blank of windows. They exist more ponderously, give out where the frank daylight fails to transmit. The trouble and suspense of things, conglomerated there in the darkness, huddled together in the darkness, reft of the relief which dawn brings when washing the walls white and gray, spotting each window pane, lifting the mist uh, from the fields, showing the red-brown cows peacefully grazing, all its, uh, all its once more decked out to the eyes, exists again. So what we see in this particular passage is the very interesting juxtaposition of uh, loneliness and, and normalcy. But so everything looks very normal, but then the whole idea of the rocket descending uh, and fading away is important because uh, we see the use of military metaphors to describe the crisis of communication in this novel, which obviously goes to show how the war pervades uh, the post-war London life and also how war pervades the language uh, of post-war London. So every banal description, every domestic description, every commonplace description is peppered with uh, military metaphors. So a rocket comes in as a metaphor over here. A rocket is something which comes, creates a lot of spark and then fades away. So in the same way, words fade away, communication fades away. So there's no, the complete crisis of communication is seen as a bit of a collapse over here. And that collapse is very carefully juxtaposed to the seemingly okay, the seemingly functional uh, signifiers like the cow grazing, uh, everything just moving on, you know, the cow is peacefully grazing, uh, you know, the window panes lifting up in the morning. Uh, so all these things which are seemingly functional actually makes the dysfunctionality more accentuated. Right, so it's like a complete dysfunctionality. The func dysfunctionality is surrounded by this signifies the functionality, which make it even more dark, even more stark uh, as a contrast. I am alone, I am alone, she cried, by the fountain in a region spark, staring at the Indian uh, and his cross. And perhaps at midnight, when all boundaries are lost, the country reverts to its ancient shape as the Romans saw it, lying cloudy, when they landed, and the hills had no names and rivers wound, they knew not where. Such was the darkness. Now, it's interesting how the whole idea of looking at England uh, at the time when the Romans came in is something which we found even in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, which we did in this case. So, the whole idea of tra taking London back to a time before its impaled glory, before its mo modernity, and seen as a barbaric uh, place of darkness when the Romans discovered and uh, you know, brought quote unquote civilization to it. It's something which is obviously, it does uh, various things, but first of all, it, it, it shows us, it, it reflects that you know, every civilization has been constructed at some point historically, and every civilization uh, comes from an era of darkness, so to speak. Right, and obviously the whole idea of darkness is very really politically motivated. It's very politically contingent. I mean, who defines what darkness is? Who defines if something is dark or not? Right, so these questions are 
uh, laid bare before us. So today London is obviously blossoming as an imperial city, but now we also take him back to a time where, you know, in the, historically London was a place which was discovered by another set of imperialists, the Romans, at that point of time, right? Uh, and th th it almost has a mystic prehistoric quality about that description, which is something which you find even in Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. Right? Now, interestingly, that darkness, that impregnable darkness, that inscrutable darkness is something which is compared to her darkness, right? So, you know, it's like everything is so mysterious, everything doesn't have any light in it, uh, there's no rationale, there's no reason uh, behind the darkness which makes it even more inscrutable and impregnable as a condition, as a cognitive condition, right? So, such words are darkness. So, you can see how uh, Razius um, existential darkness has been compared uh, to the quote unquote prehistoric darkness of London, the pre imperial prehistoric darkness of London, where no Western light of civilization had arrived, right? So, the whole idea of the Western light, of course, is politically motivated and culturally constructed and consumed. Uh, so, the whole idea of Western civilization is seen as standalone or synonymous to civilization per se, right? So, that lack of civilization, that pre civilization London is something which is compared to her darkness at this point of time. Uh, such was the darkness when suddenly, as if a shelf were shot forth and she stood on it, she said how she was his wife, married years ago in Milan, his wife, and would never, never tell that he was mad. Turning, the shelf fell, down, down she dropped, for he was gone, she thought, gone as he threatened to kill himself, to throw himself under a cart, but no, there he was, still sitting alone on the seat in his shabby overcoat, his legs crossed, staring, talking aloud. Right, so this whole idea of this madman talking aloud in a busy metropolis becomes a very graphic symbol, a very graphic um, image of PTSD or the post-traumatic stress disorder uh, experienced by the um, war veteran who comes back from the war, uh, but is unable to connect himself to any level to the metropolis. So he keeps talking to himself because he's the only person who understands himself, who understands his condition. And he, uh, he ends up being a very ununderstood man, a very misunderstood man, an unaccommodated man. And it's a lack of accommodation, this alienation is something which is physical of course, but also it's quite the cultural and existential. He cannot connect to anything that's going around around him. So the post-war London rhythms uh, don't touch him at all. Those ripples don't touch him at all. So he's still transported, he's still fixed uh, in the trauma of the war. He has, in other words, moved on uh, temporally or spatially or spatio-temporally. He's still fixated to the trauma, which is the trench trauma that he's experienced as a war veteran. By coming back to London post-war, he's unable to move on, he's unable to make connections, he's unable to recognize uh, any cultural uh, functionality that London is exhibiting at this point of time. Okay, so. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and now we have the first reference to Evans uh, in this uh, passage. Now, Evans is someone who is uh, presumably uh, Septimus's friend uh, who had died in the war. Now, Evans is a very in important uh, spectral presence in Mrs. Jalloway, right? So, he's someone who is there uh, as some kind of a shadowy, ghostly figure. Uh, he represents the every man who died in the war. But also, more specifically, he also represents the relationship that uh, you know, Septimus may have developed during the war. And there's a lot of war uh, scholarship which tells us how in that, uh, in that very claustrophobic space of the trench, uh, they also develop, along with the dread and, and phobia and the trauma, they also develop this need for mutual intimacy between the soldiers, among the soldiers. And that intimacy in the trenches, that intimacy in the very close spaces could often spill over, could often extend uh, into erotic intimacy, into sexual relationships, which are never quite spelled out. So in this novel, it's never quite clear whether Evans and Septimus had a sexual relationship, and maybe they did. But it's, this whole idea of Evans is someone who's conjured up over and over again by Septimus. And of course, Septimus uh, suffers from what we call survivor's guilt, the fact that he, he survived the war and Evans did not. All that bring, comes together to accentuate uh, the complexity of the relationship. Uh, it could be erotic, it could be existential, it is definitely very deeply emotional. And that emotionality of the relationship is something uh, which is uh, underlined over and over again. So in other words, uh, the intimacy that Septimus had with Evans is something which he, uh, is lost forever now with the death of Evans. And along with that, uh, what is also lost is Septimus's ability to be intimate, Septimus's ability to be understood, to be loved, to uh, express empathy, right? So this empathy-lessness is something which Mrs. Jalloway is entirely all about. No one understands anyone in Mrs. Jalloway. And his lack of understanding, his lack of empathy is something which makes a, uh, this particular novel uh, such a traumatic novel, right? So this novel about trauma, a novel about a post-war trauma 
London, uh, which looks very functional, which looks uh, full of velocity, vehicles of velocity are there, there are omnibuses, there are trains, there's metro, there's all these things are moving very fast and quickly, seemingly speaking. But beneath all that uh, sheen of violence, what we actually get is a very deep-seated trauma, this inability to move on. And this inability to move on is something which transfix people, especially septimers, it comes back from the war as a trauma of victim, someone who cannot move on, someone who finds his velocity intimidating, uh, someone who finds the velocity uh, alienating uh, at many, many levels. And of course, the medical scene makes it more tyrannical. The medical scene refuses to see Septimus as uh, anyone who suffers for anything. And we are told repeatedly that Mr. Holmes and Dr. Holmes, uh, and it's interesting how um, uh, Wolf chooses the name Dr. Holmes because you know, he represents the obvious illusion is sort of this hyper masculine rationalist self who seems to know everything and, and deduct everything, etc. Now he seems to say, or he decides to accept him, so to speak, that nothing is really the matter with him. And that is something which is conveyed to uh, uh, Razia, something which Razia is almost increasingly getting convinced about. right? And this idea of there's nothing is wrong with him, he needs to introspect less, he needs to uh, you know, be less narcissistic, is something which is told to our veterans over and over again. Because empirically speaking, materially speaking, somatically speaking, there's nothing wrong with them. There's no bodily injury. But that was the whole point. The trauma was actually deep-seated. The trauma was in the subconscious. And hence, we have these visions of dead soldiers which are haunting them all the time. Okay, and so um, the whole allusion to Evans is interesting, and this should be on the screen. There was his hand, there the dead, white things were assembling behind the railings opposite, but it dared not look. Evans was behind the railings. So this is a classic PTSD trigger, a post-traumatic stress disorder trigger, because what he sees across the way is the normal people, living people, city people, moving people. But what he sees actually amongst all these living and moving and functional people are dead soldiers people who died with him, the dead comrades. Uh, and obviously that hallucination, that, that image uh, evokes uh, guilt in his mind, that image evokes trauma in his mind, but also completely shakes them for any kind of connect to the reality around him. In other words, uh, Septimus over here, he inhabits a different order of reality. He inhabits a different order of embodiment, which is not uh, in sync with the normative order of reality around him. The normative order is something else. He lives in a different bubble altogether. And the two orders of space-time are completely out of sync. Your Septimus uh, is, among other things, uh, someone who is completely out of sync, someone who is completely incompatible with the rhythms, with the very compulsive rhythms of a post-war metropolis. Okay, what are you saying, said Razia suddenly, sitting down by him. Interrupted again, she was always interrupting. And the word interruption is important because, as I mentioned already, Septimus is what we might describe as someone exhibiting interrupted embodiment. His sense of embodiment, his sense of language, his sense of recognition, his sense of cognition, his sense of physicality, his sense of ego, everything has got interrupted. And that interruption is obviously very, very politically produced because, you know, part of the interruption is also because of lack of understanding. He's not understood by the medical practitioners. He's not understood by the civilians around him. And they all refuse to see him as a war hero. Uh, there is a sense of shame that is, he, he inhabits, that he embodies with his trauma. And all that comes together, uh, come together to interrupt his embodiment. And that's something which we find about Septimus quite uh, pervasively. Okay, away from people. <clears throat> they must get away from people. He said jumping up. So he's very, very jumpy. He's, uh, he's a pack of, he's a, he's a nervous wreck. Uh, he's a bunch of nerves. He's always jumpy. He's always edgy. He always wants to get away from people. He's obviously very antisocial now. And he finds it difficult, almost impossible to socialize with people, to connect to people at any level. So away from people. They must get away from people. He said jumping up. Right away from over there where there are chairs beneath a tree and a long slope of the park dipped like a length of green stuff with a ceiling, cloth of blue and pink smoke high above. And there was a rampart of far irregular houses, haste and smoke. The traffic hummed in a circle, and on the right, dun-colored animals stretched long necks over the zoo palings, barking, howling, then they sat down under a tree. So again, look at the signifiers of seeming functionality, the zoo, the people getting in, the, you know, the houses which are in order, there are cars which are moving. But amidst all this functionality, amidst all the superficiality of functionality, we have this deep-seated dysfunctionality which is inhabited and embodied by Septimus. Okay. <clears throat> uh, 
And then of course we have this entire effort made by Razia to make Seth must look at things, right? Look outside of himself because that's what the doctor had told her. Make him look outside of himself because he, according to the doctors like Holmes and Bradshaw, he suffers from morbid over introspection. He suffers from morbid narcissistic and neurotic over introspection. That's something which must be gotten rid of, according to the doctors. So he must be seen to must be asked to look out of himself. And this idea of looking out is important because that is presumably make him more social, right? And that sociality is important for Septimus to, to reestablish himself as a social person, as a connected person to the rhythms of modern life. Look, she implored him, pointing at the little troop of boys carrying cricket stumps and one shuffled, spun around on his heel and shuffled as if he were acting a clown at the music hall. So this is a very interesting uh, image, a group of boys uh, walking with cricket stumps. So cricket is obviously a very male imperial spirit uh, at this point of time. However, within this cricket team that is being seen over here, one of the guys spins around with his heel and shuffles as if he were acting as a clown at the music hall. So again, look at the very complex masculinity at play. We have a group of boys presumably headed for a cricket match, coming back from a cricket match. They have a cricket kit with them and inside the cricket uh, arrangement we have someone acting like a clown which is obviously undercutting the entire cricket masculinity that is being uh, presumably presented by this image collectively speaking. Look, she implored him for Dr. Holmes had told her to make him notice real things, to go to the music hall, play cricket. That was a very, that was a very game, Dr. Holmes said, a nice outdoor game, the very game for a husband. Again, so look at the cricket, the metaphor of cricket is important over here. Uh, cricket is an, is an imperial sport, cricket is a manly sport, cricket is a collective sport. It will give you team spirit, it will give you manliness. It's obviously a an extension of the imperial legacy as all of you would know. It was a classic imperial game and that's something which is introduced in the colonies. So cricket is advocated and prescribed for Septimus over here as a collective manly sport which will re-engineer back uh, him back into the normative order of masculinity, right? So that's an important metaphor at work. So the doctor actually asks him to play cricket because cricket will also be re-establishing, re-engineering him into the desirable model of masculinity, into the normative order of masculinity, which uh, of which he's fallen off uh, from. And so he's become dysfunctional and incompatible with that normative order of masculinity. So the whole idea is to make him normative again, is to make him compatible again to this whole idea of uh, the cricketing uh, man, the cricketing manly man. Okay. Uh, look, she repeated. So he, she keeps telling him to look and obviously the implication is he does not look. He's not concerned with anything outside of himself which is making him more and more quote unquote pathological according to the doctors. The fact that he refused to see anything outside of himself because he cannot see anything outside of himself because he's so full of trauma, he's so submerged in trauma, he's so ununderstood and so he's so living his trauma, reliving, re-experiencing his trauma all the time that he's, he, uh, it's completely impossible for him to look outside of himself into any objective or of reality, right? So he's, other words, he's inhabiting a different order of reality, which is obviously hallucinatory, which is imaginative, which is completely traumatophilic. It's a traumatic landscape of reality that Septimus is inhabiting, right? And he refuses to step out of that reality, step out of the landscape, and look at things as they are functioning around him at a very superficial level. Okay, uh, <clears throat> look, the unseen bait him. Uh, so again, Razor is the unseen, the unheard, the unseen. So her loneliness, her loneliness is actually more accentuated, as I may have mentioned already. So we have different orders of loneliness at crisscross with each other, right? So look, the unseen bade him, the voice which now communicated with him, who was the greatest of mankind, Septimus, lately taken from life to death, the Lord who came to renew society, who lay like a coverlet, a snow blanket smitten only by the sun, forever unwasted, suffering forever, the scapegoat, the eternal sufferer, but did not want to, he moaned, putting from him uh, with a wave of his hand the eternal suffering, that eternal loneliness. So again, the whole idea of Septimus being the archetypal uh, lonely man is interesting because he represents that lonely man who returns from somewhere and is never understood subsequently. We saw the figure in Joseph Conrad's Hell of Darkness. We see that in romantic poetry as well, especially in Coleridge's poem, uh, The Rhyme of the Ancient Marina. The Ancient Marina comes back from a very complex situation, uh, existential situation, and he cannot tell the story to anyone else. Uh, so this whole archetype of this ununderstood storyteller is important in literature and Septimus obviously is part of that legacy. Okay, look, she repeated, for he must not talk aloud to himself out of doors. So he must not be seen talking to himself in the public because that will be seen as a marker of insanity, a marker of rationality, a marker of madness, according to Dr. Holmes and Bradshaw. Oh, look, she implored him, but what was that to look at? A few sheep that was old. 
the way to Regent's Park tube station. Could that tell her way to Regent's Park tube station? Maisie Johnson wanted to know. She was only out from Edinburgh two years ago, two days ago. Not this way, over there, Razio exclaimed, waving her aside, lest she should see Septimus. Both seemed queer, Maisie Johnson, Johnson thought. Everything seemed very queer. In London for the first time, come to take up the purse of uncles in Leadenhall Street, and now walking through Regent's Park in the morning, this couple on the chairs gave her quite a turn. The young woman seeming foreign, the man looking queer, so that she should be very old, she should still remember and make a jangle and again, again and among, among memories, how she had walked to Regent's Park on a fine summer's morning uh, 50 years ago, for she was only 19 and had got away at last to come to London. And now how queer it was, this couple she had asked the way off, and a girl started and jerked her hand, and the man, he seemed awfully odd, quarrelling, perhaps parting forever, perhaps something was up. She knew, and now all these people she returned to, to the broadwalk, the stone basins, the prim flowers, the old men and women, invalids, most of them, in bath chairs, all seemed, after Elizabeth Edinburgh, so queer. Now see the word queer comes back almost five times, and it can mean a whole host of things. Obviously it means strange, but it can also take up a modern homoerotic uh, uh, overturns. It, it can be a reference to Septimus's covert homosexuality that he displayed towards Evans. That's not spelled out there, and the word queer in that kind of parlance was, uh, was introduced much later, uh, that took up that currency much later. It wasn't there at that point of time. But the whole point uh, is, is that looking at London from a different perspective, we have this Scottish woman, Maisie Johnson, comes from Edinburgh. For her, London is an aspirational space, a space for aspiration, a space for possibilities, a space for new openings. And now she runs across this very queer couple. The girl looks very, very uh, foreign. Obviously, Lorezia is Italian. She looks like an outsider to London. And a man looks so queer. The man looks so outdated. And then she comes across old men and women, invalids most of them in bath corners and bath chairs. Again, the whole idea of looking at London as a group of people who are invalid and old, that obviously shows the post-war demography in order. So this is a London where there's no able-bodied young men left. Uh, the able-bodied young men are either dead or mad or bruised to a point beyond recognition. So all we have are mad young men and disabled old men because that, that's sort of what did the demography of London to a large extent. So looking at London, this particular episode and Maisie Johnson is a seemingly unimportant character. But what she offers in this episode is a new look at London, a new perspective of London coming from Scotland, coming from Edinburgh. And London obviously to her is a space for aspiration, a space for triumph, a space for new openings, a space for victory. This will open up new things for her. But she finds London quite queer at this point. And the word queer is repeated five times over and over again, which obviously uh, tells you something. Uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, Maisie Johnson positively felt she must cry, oh, for the young man on the seat had given her quite a turn, something was up she knew. So there's something about uh, uh, Septimus over here which is slightly zombie-like in quality, there's something undead about him, dead as well as undead. So he inhabits that liminal space within deadness and life. And that's something which uh, shakes Maisie Johnson, who's coming to London as a naive Scottish woman. And he sees London, he had this idea of London as this opening space, as a wonderful space, as an aspirational space. And suddenly she finds completely claustrophobic and almost traumatized, almost started with a point of trauma. And this is where a point uh, that she, uh, you know, she, she says, horror, horror, she wanted to cry. She had left her people. They had warned her what would happen. So again, the whole idea of come to London against the warning, despite the warning of her Scottish um, relatives, is something which is uh, horrifying him at this point of time. And recognition why she hadn't stayed at home, she cried, twisting the knob of the iron railing. So this regret of coming to London, why she hadn't stayed at home, is something she's regretting. So again, London over here becomes a very complex space of aspiration, regret, mourning, and trauma. And this very seemingly unimportant character, Scottish young woman, 19-year-old Maisie Johnson, come to London with possibilities and aspirations, and getting decimated at so many levels, looking at the post-war people, is something that we must take into account as a very, very graphic image of violence, mourning, and trauma. So stop at this point today. We'll continue with this text in our next lecture. Thank you for your attention.